Archana, you have a question for, yeah, question for uh, Marcel. Um, Marcel, are you on? Hey. Um, so the question that came for you is, are there situations where no matter the configuration you try, some users are impacted in favor of others? The follow on to that is, how do you determine the configuration to go with and what is it based on? Yeah, so so this definitely does happen, right? And and uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's kind of an unavoidable reality, right? Some some users just there's no configuration that that creates good performance for them. Um, and at the end of the day, this this is ultimately perhaps a um, like a, a large scale architecture decision that um, maybe is a little outside of my purview. Uh, but but it's it's ultimately not really any different than than other um, sort of growth decisions, right? If, you, if you're trying to decide where to put a new point of presence, you're actually gonna have to make the same types of decisions, right? About which users are most important to be served. You know, a lot of times it's focused on decisions like who, where can we have the biggest impact across the most users, right? Which networks can we help the most? Sometimes it's about, um, there are certain networks that we otherwise have poor coverage for, so it makes sense to, to um, sort of uh, baby them along a little bit. So it, it's very case by case dependent. I, I would say there's maybe not, um, there's not sort of uniform policy that, that we can apply, but it, I, I would liken it very much to, to general sort of expansion planning. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Marcel. Um, Angelique, the next question I think is for Jim and David. Yeah, so uh, the question for Jim was referring back to uh, your comments on VPN and local peering. So what do you recommend for enterprises that are looking to fix these performance issues for workers that are working from home? Do they, how do they go about working with service providers, for example, to address some of these um, performance issues? Sure, so uh, I'd recommend that the enterprise, first of all, do a survey of their employees and find out what are they using at home? What are the providers that they have at home where they're doing their work? And then armed with that information, they can decide which provider or providers is the majority of their user base, mm -hmm. and then uh, talk with that provider. Unfortunately, a lot of providers have historically had the attitude, particularly if they're smaller telcos, that the way to fix this problem is you buy a connection from them for your enterprise and now your problem is fixed, but it's only fixed for you. It, doesn't, it isn't fixed for everybody else. Um, so that's generally the answer that most of the, uh, the suppliers want, but uh, obviously uh, having discussions with them, particularly if uh, uh, you have you know, some economic incentives uh, to offer in terms of doing business with them, um, and, and, you know, try to convince them to do more peering publicly. Uh, but certainly if you absolutely have to fix the problem for your enterprise, buy a connection from that other provider. Hmm. Good okay. advice. David, um, question for you. You've been tracking disruptions, internet outages for a long time now, right? And so what is it that you've noticed um, or something that's changed, uh, stayed the same um, with, you know, from the perspective of lockdowns? Sure, yeah, and, and it's an interesting question. It's something I've been actually thinking about for the last couple of months as well. Um, I think that we've seen internet disruptions due to, um, you know, network issues, uh, fiber cuts, cable cuts, you know, things like that. Um, those have, you know, more or less continue to pace. Um, I think you're always going to have errant anchors and, and, you know, configuration issues and things like that. I, I think what we've seen a decline in over the last couple of months have been the large scale uh, government directed shutdowns. Um, the two week shutdown in Ethiopia that just kind of ended notwithstanding. But, um, you know, I, I had been talking to some colleagues about that as well. And, um, you know, there was this question of, you know, is it is, is that decline because governments are finally realizing just how critical the Internet is for everybody's, you know, everybody's lives now, uh, you know, thanks to, to, to the pandemic, thanks to the lockdowns. Um, but I think what we ultimately realized uh, is that it's less that, unfortunately, and more that a lot of the events that historically drove the shutdowns, the, the riots, 
the um, elections, the things like that, those have been not taking place uh, or they've been postponed or well, the elections have been postponed, the riots haven't been taking place, uh, you know, it, depending where you are, of course. Uh, but, but those sorts of activities, uh, I think are happening with lower frequency right now, which is then driving um, uh, the government's uh, to, to, has been driving fewer government directed uh, large scale internet shutdowns. Um, and I'll use this as an opportunity also to, to plug my blog, uh, internet disruption report. Um, and work that we're doing at the Internet Society as well uh, on the Measuring the Internet Project, um, looking at internet shutdowns. Thank you, David. We have a, a follow-on question for Jeff, if uh, if he's still on. Uh, certainly so Andrew has a, has a follow-up question to, to your response. So um, he has said, if everything morphs into web apps, how do you see this impacting open standards, security, and ultimately privacy? He's pessimistic, pessimistic, he said. Oh, I think it's perfectly reasonable to be incredibly pessimistic about the internet. <laughs> um, indeed, trying to search for something that, that hasn't quite got this sort of ring of, of acute pessimism is, is at times quite challenging. Um, the early days when we thought this opened up broad horizon of digital communication where any protocol was possible, any form of interaction was possible, where we discovered and were playing with all kinds of methods of communication, um, sort of vaporized at some point because we abused that environment so horribly that everyone put up filters and firewalls. And, and this response to this level of abuse is actually almost worse than the problem it was trying to counter, that we are locking this down now and creating intermediaries, creating a brokered communication environment, all in the name of enhanced security. But of course, the fundamental observation is, if we're relying on security being prime number factorization, the first quantum computer that works will blow that out of the water. If we're relying on security being a bunch of CAs that never ever lie except they, when they lie, then again, this whole stuff is terrible. So I can share Andrew's pessimism that we're building a very encased internet and trying to think that the little bit of greenery we've managed to fence around is greenery worth living in. The problem is it's probably not. And, and the issue is, I think in some ways, what we don't do is look further afield. We don't measure, we don't observe, we don't feedback. We are constantly just reacting and very little understanding. And I think part of it is that we kind of lost the research and academic community somewhere down the path of commercialization. Mm -hmm. And somewhere along this, we kind of assumed, well, this is all done. This is all fine. Thank you, Boffins. You can go home now. We understand this so well. We're just going to exploit it for what it's worth. But I think that feedback loop of understanding what's going wrong in exploitation is missing. And creating ever more draconian firewalls and shutting the apertures down ever more highly and creating systems where the poor operators, as we saw at the moment, are pulling what's left of their hair out, trying to balance traffic. This shouldn't be happening. If we can make self-driving cars, why can't we make self-driving networks? What is wrong with us and why we managed to get it so thoroughly wrong is actually a really, really good question. We don't understand what's happening. We don't watch closely, problem A, but B, we actually don't think about what we've just seen and put it into context and understand where to go from here. And so the result is, as Andrew observes, we lose privacy, we actually lose flexibility, we lose a whole bunch of things that in the long term are valuable. And so, yes, this is not the ideal place to be. I'm sorry, it's just not. And trying to understand how to make it better is I think the challenge for all of us. And I would encourage folk, you know, the researchers are not dumb. The researchers are actually part and parcel of an ecosystem that hauls us back out of this mess. So thank you, Andrew, good point. <laughs> well, maybe that's not too pessimistic. <laughs> so we have a open question to anyone on, um, any one of our speakers who would like to comment. And this is, um, you know, about the segmenting and closing off of the internet with uh, actions by Russia or things like new IP under the Chinese government, if, if any um, of our speakers want to comment on that. 
So the question is about, you know, how effectively the internet, the internet is kind of fragmenting or, you know, kind of um, becoming different internets, if you will, given Russia, given China, and there was some specific reference to new IP under the Chinese government, which I think you've written about, Jeff. Um, as, as yes, I did, yeah. Think, yeah. Um, I actually think new IP is a throwback to the 1990s. Um, what is being, I suppose, proposed inside this model is, is back to a model of dumb applications, dumb hosts, and clever network. It's the whole QoS thing all over again. The internet is a scarce resource. Applications don't know how to make use of it. The network itself will arbitrate, manage, and massage traffic and actually control the applications. Now, if you're a vendor of network equipment, everything I've said is wonderful. Because all of a sudden, you're the center of the spending. You are the gatekeeper. You're the toll box. You're the reason why routers cost millions of dollars. The thing is, no one else believes you. And no matter which learned committee of greybeards you go to in the ITU, the answer is the internet is a marketplace. And what fuels the internet is my money and your money. It's how we behave. And if we want Chrome to do wonderful things, if we want our browsers to leap over tall buildings, if we want a different network, our money makes it. And so in some ways, I think the Chinese stuff is really just regressive, uh, badly thought through, um, focused on all the wrong things. We've been there, done that and moved on. And quite frankly, uh, is doomed for failure in exactly the same way that OSI was doomed for failure. It's the wrong approach. We've lived that life. We're moving on. Cool. Okay. So another question that's come in, um, this one maybe, I don't know if you can answer this, uh, Jana. Um, uh, so this is around how CDN use has changed for customers. Has there been anything in the wake of shutdown in terms of like maybe what they're caching on CDNs, how they're using it to better optimize uh, traffic delivery? Have you seen anything like that? So off the top of my mind, I don't, know if anyone's changed their config significantly. I mean, I, I, I certainly haven't heard of any patterns of changes happening across the board, but one thing for certain is that, you know, customers who are seeing surges are relying more on our CDN and, and also on, on facilities like shielding. So we offer this two tier thing where mm. you, you can put a, a shield node in front of your origin server so that uh, across multiple pops, requests get collapsed on their way coming to your origin server. And again, that's, those are all just ways of scaling your service across the world. And that's, uh, I think that broadly speaking, customers uh, who, who've seen surges definitely rely more on our services. But I, I don't know that there's any pattern as such. Mm -hmm. uh, so changes maybe in configs. Right, right. But maybe using maybe more of the security features or using it to, as you said, shield their origins, maybe using like hierarchical um, approach to the CDN deployment. Is that what you're referring to? Well, sure. Yeah, that too. Um, uh, that's certainly in, in part of the, the, the shielding that we offer. But I think, yeah, uh, broadly speaking, again, it's, it's, it's a... Um, it's the reliance on 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 uh, on facilities and on organizations that allow you to scale. Fastly is one of them, and that's the sort of thing that we see. 